Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us both here in Helsinki and online. My name is Faye Callahan. I work for UN Global Pulse, and thank you for joining our event on digital public goods. We have a fairly packed agenda um, to get through, um, so I will waste no time in introducing, for opening remarks, Satu Lassila from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, our co-host for this event. Thank you so much, and, and dear participants, dear colleagues, I'm very happy to welcome you to this event, focused on digital public goods in the field of maternal, newborn, and child health. The event is co-hosted by the UN Global Pulse and the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Finland. And let me start by highlighting that the innovation and digital development are long-term priorities in the Finnish development policy. We see them as absolutely essential for reaching the sustainable development goals. The UN, of course, is a very important partner to us in this field. We are proud to host and support a growing number of UN technology and innovation programs in Finland, including the UN Global Pulse. In 2020, a new framework for strengthening cooperation on digital matters was launched. It was the UN Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Cooperation. Finland has been a strong supporter of the roadmap and has contributed to its implementation. We have specifically focused on advancing work related to digital inclusion, artificial intelligence and digital public goods, the focus of today's event. Maternal, newborn and child health is one of the core elements to the sexual and reproductive health and right work prioritized in our development policy. We know that unfortunately the COVID-19 pandemic has diverted resources from the sexual and reproductive health services. This will likely lead to an increase in maternal and newborn mortality. The number of unsafe abortions may also grow. In this context, digital public goods offer important potential for improving maternal, newborn and child health, helping to improve and save lives of people living in vulnerable situations. Finland is proud to work multilaterally with UN Global Pulse and the Digital Public Goods Alliance to support this agenda. Dear participants, we know that scaling innovations is not easy. There are several barriers related to funding, expertise, partnerships and other critical enablers that need to be addressed. I hope the project under discussion today can contribute to strengthening this type of support in the future. Finland is actively engaging with the Digital Public Goods Alliance and UN Global Pulse regarding the next steps and the implementation of the recommendations coming out of this project. Together with our UN partners, we want to continue our support to those engaged in developing and scaling digital public goods. I hope today's, ev today's event will also shed more light on uh, what this can mean in practice. In the end, what really matters is the change that we make on the ground. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Satu, for those encouraging words. Just a note for everyone joining us online, we have a Q&A function. There'll be a panel discussion towards the end of the event. So feel free to add your questions there or also network with your colleagues in the chat function. Now I'd like to introduce Projector Kualeka from the Digital Public Goods Alliance, who will tell us everything we need to know about digital public goods. Thank you, Faye. Hello, everyone. My name is Prajakta Kualekar. I've come from Bangalore, India, if it wasn't obvious from what I'm wearing already. Right? I'm going to take you back a little bit to 2009. Um, this is India, 2009. Um, so India has public distribution system, right? Ration system by which people get um, basic ration by the state. Um, there used to be long queues at these ration shops in 2009. There used to be... Uh, not just long queues, but people had to stand in long queues and at the end of it, they sometimes didn't even get ration. Why? 
because the person at the end of the um, you know the the desk was deciding who should get ration and who shouldn't get ration based on his relationships and other cultural aspects in our society. In 2019, all you need to do is basically go show your biometrics and demand the service of ration or anything else, right? Um, in 2019, 245 million new bank accounts were opened. Out of those, 230 million were opened by women. And all of that was possible because of this one digital public good called Aadhaar. Aadhaar is India's national ID system. And you can read up more on it. I've put it on the screen what it, what it means. And uh, behind that, the digital public good that enables all this is called MOSIP, which is Modular Open Source Identity Platform. Right? And this is a digital public good that now it's also a verified digital public good that's being adopted by three more governments, Philippines, perhaps Morocco, and Ethiopia as well. Right? Um, why I gave this example is, you know, sometimes learning about digital public goods technically can be a little bit boring, right? But these examples can actually sort of help us empathize with why it's important to have digital public goods. Now, what is a digital public good? A digital public good is an open source software, content collection, open data, or open AI. Any of these projects, any of these digital solutions can be called digital public goods. But for them to be called digital public goods, they obviously have to abide by certain basic principles. Where did these basic principles come from? I think Satu also alluded to the um, roadmap for digital cooperation, which was set out by the United Nations Secretary General. Um, and this roadmap sort of has the basic fundamental principles for what a digital public good might be, right? And then there are, Three, so this is the entire definition of what digital public goods are. But what I'm going to try to do in the next five minutes is to break that down for you and tell you about um, how they actually are built and how they sort of help society at large. So there are three basic principles behind a digital public good. It has to advance the SDG. It has to be open source, which means that uh, the code for that digital solution has to be you know, publicly available for everyone to sort of uh, adopt. And it has to do no harm, right? Which is, again, it's, it's the com you, main principle behind the larger common agenda of the UN. Um, now, how do these three principles come down to a standard or a set of indicators that will define what a digital public good is? So today, not any open software can just call themselves a digital public good, right? they have to basically go through this application process. And that application process determines what digital solution can be uh, called a digital public good and which one cannot be. The eight indicators that define what the digital public good should be are as follows. The first one is, of course, it has to be relevant to sustainable development goals. It has to use an approved open license. And when I say approved open license, we have actually given a list of organizations um, or ca catalogs, basically, where you know these list of licenses are available and only those licenses are permit permitted. Um, third is clear ownership. What we also do is this standard that you see on the screen is an open standard, right? So this keeps evolving every year almost every other month, honestly, at this point. Uh, but because of that, we want digital public goods to keep updating their documentation as we move through the standard. So we need to definitely have an organization or a person owning this uh, digital public good. Fourth is platform independence. Some of these are a little bit technical, so I'm going to keep it high level. But of course, in q and I'm happy to answer any questions that are deeper. Fourth is platform independence, which means that the digital public good has to be able to um, run without any proprietary software. So which means that all the necessary documentation and all the necessary architecture has to be available in public domain for anybody to sort of uh, take this and run it. Um, the fifth one is documentation. Again, the technical documentation behind um, how to run this digital public good has to be available online. So any lay person, anybody without any technology background should also be able to run, launch, and use this digital public good. 
mechanism for extracting data a little bit technical again, but for projects for projects that don't have um, PII data, which is uh, you know the inf the personal information of a human being. Uh, for projects that don't have that, there has to be a way to extract that data from the project. So for example, if it's an open data uh, environmental DPG, anybody should be able to sort of extract this data without using, again, any proprietary software. So there has to be a way to just download something without using a third party proprietary software. Um, Seventh one is adherence to privacy and applicable laws. I think this is also directly borrowed from the definition and talks a little bit about why, you know, what are the a basic principles, but also what are the base, best practices that one has to abide by to ensure privacy and to ensure, you know, all the laws that are a part of sort of that, that need to be followed by that digital public good are followed. Eighth one is adherence to standards and best practices. Now in the digital world, there are a lot of these principles of digital development and you know, best practices that basically lay out how to build a digital product that is going to sort of um, get you to meet your outcomes, but at the same time also do no harm, right? Um, so we've also listed some of these best practices and we'll keep adding to these, right? So as the world, as uh, you know, maybe the global, uh, UN Global Pulse Labs or you know, similar such bodies as they evolve and create more sort of registries, catalogs, we will keep adding them to this standard. And the ninth one, which is actually broken down into three different parts, is do no harm. And the three, 9A, 9B, 9C, are basically talking about against uh, protection against harassment. It's talking about how do you keep, so the users of the digital public good and their safety. And it also talks about you know, what kind of uh, precautionary measures that the digital solution has to take to make sure they do no harm at large. And we also focus a little bit, I'm gonna go back a little bit, but we also focus on, I must mention this, do no harm by design, right? So the expectation is that obviously we can't, the person who's making this digital public good cannot always control the downstream implications of this product, which is why we make sure that, you know, in design itself, they've sort of the core of the product is thought of in a way that it, it does no harm at large. Um, what happens to this standard, right? So some of us, sit and uh, wet applications that come from various, so we get applications like 10 applications every week and they come from private sector, they come from public sector, they come from Africa, they come from Asia, they come from everywhere. And we have this three step process by which we decide whether they can be a digital public good or not. But we also make sure that while we're telling them if they can be one, we also help them become one, right? So we're also trying to build capacity through this review vetting process. It's also kind of an advocacy tool by which you know, you're talking to actual solution makers about how they can um, go about uh, improving their solution, right? And what happens to all these solutions? They basically go into this DPG registry. And just last week we had met in Oslo, all the members, and we heard that you know, some of the, some of the, so somebody from Sri Lanka was narrating how ministry officials have actually started using this registry, which is actually, if you go on the website, you'll see it, it's a list, right? But they go and sort of check the registry and the documentation that is submitted by the project before they even do meetings with some of these digital solutions, at least in low and middle income countries. So that, you know, that probably is where uh, we want to go and the registry should sort of um, help with people who are looking for procurement of digital public goods as well, right? Um, now, you know, how does all of this come together, right? We know what digital public goods are, we know what, you know, how are they sort of governed in that sense, but now who does all this, right? And, and today, so the Digital Public Goods Alliance is basically a multi-stakeholder initiative where we also have some members that joined last week and I've not had the moment to sort of add those logos, but five members jo joined last week as well, right? And the alliance can be joined by either member states or it can be joined by development sector organizations and they could be from anywhere in the world, right? But the idea is come together, create a platform that's more sort of you know, universal and then support digital public goods. Now, what is supporting digital public goods would mean? It would mean these four things, right? So we want to improve the discoverability, sustainability, and the management of digital public goods. 
We want to help both private and public sector institutions with building capacity, as I mentioned earlier, to promote and support digital public goods and their adoption, right? It's not only enough to make it, right? It's also important that they get deployed and used. Um, the third would be mainly for low and middle income countries where you know they need capacity in terms of both financial or non-financial resources to deploy and maintain them. Uh, and then building an ecosystem, right? Like larger, why we are sitting here today is to build that ecosystem, I think. But to build an ecosystem where this becomes a sustainable process where you know, you're not sort of constantly thinking about how to do local implementations, but you have like a sort of a larger ecosystem that supports both local implementations and also knowledge sharing at a much sort of higher level. Um, now, anybody can be a part of this initiative, right? We even have digital public goods that have now become so big, become a member of the alliance because they can also support in a lot of things that I mentioned already. Uh, we do this with three different types of activities. Um, the first is core, which means that, so I work at the DPGA secretariat, right? So the alliance that you saw earlier, I'm only speaking on behalf of them, right? And um, all of those member organizations, they all have core activities, which they do internally in their organization for digital public goods. Then they have coordinated activities where, you know, maybe a donor organization and like an organization that's deploying a digital public good will come together and work together. And then we have aligned activities where the secretariat or the alliance may not play a role, but the organization themselves, independent of the secretariat, does a lot of things. So this could even be like a coordinated activity, right? Um, and if you suppose did this event without maybe the DPJ, which you can, would be like an aligned activity. Uh, so these are three types of activities by which you know you can be a part of a roadmap, which is what I will come to and which is what I want to leave you with today. Um, so the DPGA roadmap is essentially a list of activities, a list of um, you know the tools, list of events that are happening around the world every year. And what we're trying to do is put all of that together so that we can look at it collaboratively, we can look at it as an aggregate and see how the DPGA has been, you know, able to help its member organizations. And so it's also like a sort of a tool to keep measuring our impact in that sense. And um, this roadmap is given, you know, right now it's there on our website and we're like sort of making it, you know, like a crowdsourced version of that whereby, you know, even the members can sort of update it whenever they want, et cetera. But this roadmap is what most of the DPGA's work will revolve around in the next, um, you know, in the next few years. And so you can either join the roadmap, you can also, you know, if you have a digital solution in your country, in your organization that, you know, needs some capacity building uh, to go open source or to become a DPG, we're sort of happy to help with that. And um, yeah, and that would be, you know, I hope to see a lot more members in the next few months uh, joining the DPGA and furthering this digital public goods agenda. Um, and with that, I think, yes, I think I hand it over to Faye again. Thanks a lot for everyone. And if you have any questions, I'm available later. Thanks, Projecta. That was a really great introduction to DPGs and the work of the Alliance. Um, and as she mentioned, we will have a session later if anybody has any questions. I'm going to talk to you now a little bit about um, a project that I've been working on uh, for UN Global Pulse in coordination with the DPGA, the Alliance, and kindly supported by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland. So we came together and we had this idea a little while ago about seeing how we could advance the use of DPGs in maternal, newborn and child health. And my background is a maternal health specialist. Um, so we set out on this process of understanding what people are using in this field at the moment, what they feel they need, how it works, what the challenges are um, in this field. As we got started on the work, though, we realized that actually a lot of the things we were discovering were applicable across health rather than just maternal, newborn and child health. So we decided to broaden out the, the scope of the work to encompass health, to, to share the learnings in a broad way using maternal, newborn, child health as a kind of a case example. But that then turned out to be a really big project. So we also decided to narrow the focus specifically on scaling. So when looking at digital public goods, what are the scaling challenges and enablers? 
So the methodology for this work was a research project, qualitative and quantitative. So the first um, approach was some key informant interviews with stakeholders across the range of um, organizations interested in digital public goods. So as you can see from the chart here, both innovators, NGOs who are implementing the DPGs, the funders, the ministries, and, and people um, in policies uh, with, a, with a stake in, in how this work develops. And also we spoke to a number of UN agencies that are both developing digital public goods themselves and uh, implementing them as part of their program work. And then we did a survey. So the qualitative research brought out a number of findings, which I'll run through in a second. And we wanted to validate that with the owners of the digital public goods themselves. So we sent out a survey to them and um, I will show you the results shortly. So back to the qualitative findings. So as the initial research focused very much on maternal, newborn and child health, Two of the themes that came out of it were very specific to that. I'm not going to run through that today, um, but it is my uh, interest area. So if anyone wants to find out more, just get in touch and I can share those findings with you. Um, the other two themes, though, um, are relevant across all areas of digital public goods. And the first one was around the innovation process itself. And some of the, the, the points that people brought up were really around the driver of need. So in theory, a digital public good should be developed in response to a challenge that, for example, a Ministry of Health have established is, is an issue that they need solving in their country. In reality, that isn't always the way that things happen and innovators get really excited and think of a solution to a problem that maybe doesn't exist or only exists in a particular context. And that has issues for sustainability of that product and take up and demand. The next issue people raised was around funding. So again, when there were, say, uh, hackathons or development challenges, sometimes run by UN agencies or by other donors, other funders, that was great for um, piloting a, a concept and, and, and coming up with a really fascinating idea of how to overcome a problem. But then there was a real problem with um, getting funding to sustain that product, to develop it further, to move it into a bigger pilot, to um, get some more data on, on how it was useful. And, and innovators in particular were saying they didn't know where to access these different sources of funding and or how to be successful in them. So they needed support with that. The third area in the innovation process was around coordination. And that was um, apparent when I was speaking to implementers of, of, of the uh, innovations, saying that they may go into a particular village to work with some healthcare workers who were already piloting another concept, another innovation. And, you know, that's not only pretty inefficient and putting a lot of burden on those overworked healthcare workers, but also we're not sharing data. So innovators wanted a way to understand how they could not pilot something if it's already been done, just to take that data. How could we coordinate in a, an ecosystem much better? And then the final thing in the innovation process was ongoing support. So there are tons of guidelines, uh, toolkits, methodologies, um, and uh, different recommendations for how you do uh, digital innovation and how you scale those. But people weren't sure which ones to access, which ones were relevant, which ones are up to date, or which ones are appropriate to them. And actually, once they've read the theory, they really wanted that hands-on personalized support of what is gonna work for my innovation, what do I need? And the innovators themselves know what they need. They just struggle to access the right people to support them with that. And then we looked at the, the particular scaling innovation challenges and success factors. The challenges, a lot of it came down to finances, funding, sustainable business models, um, which my colleague Ian will talk to you about uh, shortly. Um, but we also saw a lot of success factors. So where DPGs had scaled successfully, it was often down to relationships. So an NGO um, had worked with an, with an innovator um, or an owner of a digital public good, built relationships at local, regional, and national level with, in my um, case, the Ministry of Health to create local ownership of that product, integrate it into the digital health strategy, make sure there was buy-in across um, other ministries as well. And then that led to scaling by demand. So each region wanted to have that product because they knew it worked well for them. And I'll show you a, um, a case study um, that really exemplifies that um, in a moment. Back to the survey we sent out to digital public good owners. Um, and we asked them a range of questions and we allowed them to, to input what, what the challenges they faced were. 
and they uh, wrote quite a few, uh, most of these listed here. But then we said, OK, if you had to pick one, which was your highest priority challenge? And as you can see quite clearly on the graph, it's around financing. And when we dug deeper into that, it's around financing for a sustainable business model. So how should they set up their, their innovation in a way that is sustainable? And again, Ian will talk to you about that um, later on. So the recommendations from, from the research that we did um, were to, to consolidate the guidance. And these recommendations aren't necessarily for, for UN Global Pulse to take forward, but the UN system and others that are working um, with the Digital Public Goods Alliance and, and stakeholders within that. Um, so some consolidation of the guidance will be really useful. Some recommendations on what guidance is useful for which type of innovations or at which stage you're in in your process. Innovators are really demanding access to expertise um, on a personalised level. And again, uh, my colleague Ahmed will, will talk about how we might, as you and Global Pulse, um, try to contribute to that support in a moment. And then also there's this need to share not only the, the kind of programmatic learnings from, from a pilot or an implementation of a DPG, but the actual data itself. And as Projector mentioned, data can be a digital public good. And we're doing a lot of work in Global Pulse to see how we can encourage shared data. Um, just to prevent us from reinventing the wheel and uh, not collaborating more closely. So I will um, show you a short video now um, of a case study that really exemplifies how a digital public good, in this case Comcare, which is owned by Demaji, worked very closely with the Ministry of Health in Burkina Faso and the NGO Tedezom to um, use a digital public good to improve their management of sick children. <laughs> So um, um, my name is uh, Carl Blanchet. I work at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I was uh, the core principal in investigator of the YEDA uh, study. So in a context like Burkina Faso, where child mortality is very, very high, we have a lot of uh, assumptions that actually the quality of care is not good enough. And one of the reasons is because the clinical protocols, the uh, IMCI algorithm is not respected by healthcare workers. So um, we really think that having YEDA in place and being scaled up to the whole country and to all health centers can really, really save lives. The fact that actually all the users can provide some feedback and this feedback is actually uh, used or applied by Patelizom to make changes and improve the system and improve the tool I think it's a huge improvement compared to other innovations. It's very flexible, uh, it is, it responds to the needs and to the request from the users. We conducted the YEDA study, but the YEDA study is actually three different studies combined together. The first one is a quantitative study looking at the effect of uh, YEDA on the adherence to the IMCI protocol but as well on correct or incorrect classifications and prescriptions. The second study was a process evaluation to look at the effect of the context, but as well uh, the effect of the YEDA intervention on the management of health centers, on uh, team management, but as well on the acceptance of the innovation by the community and by healthcare workers. And finally, we conducted an economic study where we look at the cost of implementing and managing YEDA and the cost of scanning up YEDA to the whole country. I think YEDA needs to be um, it's really an innovation where they can make a difference uh, at primary health care level in many, many countries. So by having uh, very much an electronic tool to help clinicians make the right decisions, I really hope that uh, YEDA could be applied and tested in various contexts, uh, doing emergencies, 
It could be in refugee camps, but as well in the acute phases of, uh, of armed conflict, for example. Thank you to Ted Isomt for allowing us to share that video, which I think really showed the power of what a digital public good can achieve. Um, and thank you to everyone who participated in the research, both the qualitative and, and filled in the survey for us. Um, so moving on to our scaling challenges, I would now like to introduce Ian Gray, who is our scaling senior advisor, who will talk to you um, about some challenges and some potential solutions. Thanks, Faye. Thanks, everyone. So scaling, what is it? Um, I've worked on scaling for about 10 years now uh, across the development and humanitarian sectors, um, supporting lots of innovations on their scale journey. And we just wanted to talk through some of the lessons we've learned on that journey and some of the things that work well and some of the challenges that still exist. So what is scale? How do you define it? And that's often a question I have when first engaging with people about scale. And so here's some of the clients that I have and their definitions. What you'll notice is they're all different. <laughs> so every client I work with has a different view of what scale is. The one that's probably closest to mine is Nestor's at the bottom right. Um, the scale is about growing the social innovations impact to match the level of need. But there isn't a clearly defined um, definition that everyone sticks to, but it is something that you need to work out because you need to talk with everyone involved in an innovation about what scale means to them. When we first started looking at this, I did this piece of research and work with a colleague, Dan McClure, who was at ThoughtWorks, one of the partners um, in the Alliance, many years ago. And what we realized was there was a lot of information about the front end of innovation, kind of how do you validate an idea? So using kind of lean entrepreneurship, using user-centered design, using all of these different approaches to really validate an idea. And then there was lots that had been written and worked on once you've got a replicable solution, how do you optimize that and keep that going? back to lean manufacturing and those kind of ideas from total quality management and those kind of manufacturing ideas. What there wasn't much written about or talked about at that time was, okay, how do you get from one place to the other? How do you get from validating an idea to having this scaled replicable solution that is used almost everywhere? And there's this kind of missing middle where this miracle of scale happens. What's been interesting, particularly when it comes to DPGs is, there's also potentially a missing middle when it comes to when the area that I've looked at the most, which is the software components of DB, DPGs, is there sometimes appears this missing middle around the core software itself. And so we've already heard that in order to become a DPG, you need a clear owner. And what we've found is with a lot of DPGs, getting the owner right and getting their business model right are sometimes quite a difficult thing to do. And sometimes you have that missing middle of who's taking ownership of the ongoing updating of that software, who's taking ownership in terms of making sure that it remains interoperable, that it remains secure and stable. So that ongoing community of support can sometimes be a hollow middle that isn't funded, whereas the rest of the activities around or other software around is supported. So you sometimes have that missing middle as well. That's not the only middle. There's the messy middle. So I like this, it's from UNHCR many years ago. Those of you who are eagle-eyed will see that they only really talk about the front end of innovation in here. What you actually find is, if you think this is messy, scaling is far messier because there are more stakeholders involved. There's more context involved. There's more different um, things that you need to manage um, when you're going at scale compared to when you're at that kind of early stage prototype or pilot. And what that ends up with is Cantor's law. So Rosabeth Cantor is a professor at Harvard and she came up with this law that 
everything looks like a failure in the middle. So if you're in the middle of trying to scale things, it can feel like a failure. Everyone loves those inspiring beginnings. Hey, we've done this cool pilot, this cool experiment. Look how great it is. Everyone loves the end story of what we've just had from IED in terms of, okay, here's what we've done in terms of our scale in Burkina Faso. This is what it looks like. It's great. No one really enjoys that middle bit of getting from A to Z, as it were. So it can be quite difficult to manage. And you can hear that expressed in the research that Faze just talked to us about. So let's jump in a little bit to our experience on some of the things that came up. So when I looked at the research that Faye had, these are all the things that got over 10%. So it was demand, it was financing, it was sustainability, and it was integration and interoperability. So I'm just going to give you a glimpse of, glimpse of some of the challenges around those and talk a little bit about how we deal with that when we're supporting uh, DPGs. So the first thing is that most innovation literature and support is designed around business to consumer markets. So if I look at my phone here, I buy it, I use it, and I get the benefit from it. So all I need to think about as I'm scaling is, how do I scale to a market of people like me? So it's actually quite simple, really. But then if you go to business to business or business to government, you then need to think about buyers and users. So when we're talking about some of the innovations that we're working with within Global Pulse, we're getting conversations about, okay, the users, the analysts who are using this are either really excited by it or are actually having some problems with it. But that's different from the decision makers. So there's economic decision makers, there's economic buyers, there's a whole group that are involved within a, any administration or bureaucracy or organization around the purchase and adoption and use. And so their thoughts, their aspirations, their wants, their needs are not always aligned. I'm sure it, everyone's always aligned in your organizations, but you will find in other organizations, not everyone's aligned. So it gets difficult. When it comes to DPG markets, it gets even more difficult because you need to find alignment between not only the buyer, who might be um, a department head within a Ministry of Health, for instance, the user that might be a community health worker, but also with those who you're trying to impact. So it might be maternal child health. So it might be young children. It might be pregnant women. So you've got to find that alignment across all three. And what I find when working with innovations that are trying to scale is sometimes they've only focused on one of these groups. Sometimes they've done well and focused on two, but often they've not focused on all three. And so we work with them to understand where there's alignment and misalignment across the three and what they need to do to stimulate that adoption. Just one more thing on this, and Faye, you discussed it. There is still a problem of solutions looking for a problem. So there is still things that are created that really we've not understood the problem sufficiently. We've not understood what the user or the impact group wants sufficiently. And so we're trying to get demand for a product that actually there's no need for. But if there is a need for it, really understanding the decision-making processes, the decision-makers and all the different groups that are involved in a DPG are critical in going to scale. Financing was a big one. And financing and sustainability are heavily linked. But what we often find is, as you go from left to right, which lots of DPGs do, this gets more and more difficult. So the first phase is innovation funding. And you'll find that people go and get small kind of seed pilot funding, prototype funding. Then they've got to find a way, how do they fit it into the economic engine of whether it's a ministry or whether it's the aid sector? How do they fit it into the normal granting and contracting processes that happen? And particularly if your innovation is just part of a larger program, how do you embed it in? So if you're just reliant on grants and contracts, you often have cash flow issues and you often struggle to actually go beyond just deploying the innovation and funding actually the ongoing maintenance, tech support, training, all the things that need to wrap around it. The ultimate goal is to get on core budget. So how do you actually get into a ministry's budget? 
how do you actually get into the core budget of an NGO or a UN agency? That is really difficult to do. And what we're finding is that innovations in the DPG and in the wider digital space struggle to make those jumps of innovation funding to grants and contracts. If they make that jump, then struggle often to make core budget. And that's critical for sustainability. This is a slide that I've borrowed off Heath Aronson from Dial, um, who I did a lot of work with over the past few years. And it really shows where that value of death is and describes this in more detail. So the light blue line shows where the kind of investment is, whether that's in grants, whether it's in soft loans, whether it's in contract um, kind of innovation funds. So you can see what happens is in the innovation phase that goes up, great, it's covering costs, but it starts to come down. And then what you've got to achieve is the dark blue line of can we get some kind of sustainable business model going through the piece? And you hit that valley of death. So those of you who are aware of Roger's diffusion curve, that's often between early um, adopters and the early majority in most markets. And so what happens here is if you can't make that work, if you can't make that bridge, you often find lots of DPGs and other digital innovations not making it through. Even if they do make it through, it can be really quite difficult. I would recommend you read Sean McDonald's blog from Frontline SMS when he talks about them winding up Frontline SMS. And it's a really good example if you want to look at Frontline SMS as a digital good that's in the public domain with, say, Rapid Pro which is UNICEF and partners. And so what's the difference between the two? How have they made those business models work or not work? And what we're finding is, if certainly for startups, this valley of death is a, a bigger deal. And potentially, if you've got a natural scaling route like you have through UNICEF that can then be used to piggyback and provide those services to ministries and those kind of um, bigger organizations. So it really is an issue that needs work and one that we've seen in the research is a significant struggle. And that links to sustainability. So one of the things I say about scale is, scale is sustainability plus replicability. If you've got the replicability, you see things that scale quickly, but they're not sustainable. Or if you've got the sustainability, but you haven't got really good replicability, it won't get to scale. So you need both of those. They're not the only ingredients, but they're really strong ingredients. And this builds on the, um, the digital principle of build for sustainability. And so really thinking that through is quite critical in your kind of scale journey. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. The second one is this integration and interoperability. And a really critical factor on that is around obviously APIs and those kind of things when you look at it from a tech perspective. But more important than those tech integration pieces is what's called Conway's Law. So Conway's Law in the 60s talks about any digital system will essentially mimic and replicate the communication system within an organization and the way communication and business processes flow. And so what we find is that if you're replicating that well, it does two things. One is it means your innovation is probably incremental. It's not going to be hugely transformative, but it's more likely to be scaled. And currently we're writing the innovation section of the um, State of the Humanitarian System report that will come out later this year. And we're looking at digital data gathering as a kind of a service that's, that's happened and scaled over the past 10 years or so. And what we've found with that is it very much sticks to Conway's law. It very much sticks to the digital principle that we have here of understanding the existing ecosystem. So by being able to be layered over how evaluations, assessment, monitoring already happens, there was little resistance from users. And if we go back to that buy user target impact group, there was also little resistance from buyers because it was really helpful to get assessment data early, particularly in humanitarian situations, to be able to write your proposal to get your funding. So you had alignment across those groups. It was really good for those who were, for instance, affected by disasters to be able to provide insight into their situation as well. 
So strong alignment, understanding the existing ecosystem, understanding how the processes work, and then layering that with digital transformation was really helpful in scaling that. So thinking that through is really critical. So just some scaling solutions, and then before I hand over to Ahmed. The first one is there are tools out there. So I was the lead author on this for HIF and ELRA. It's a guide to scale. So there are tools, there are things that you can access on that. Um, I think that will go in the chat, but it's a humanitarian innovation guide. It can be used for development as well. And it talks you through a process of putting together a scale strategy and really thinking through how you scale. Another one that really looks at the sustainability issue is, again, I was a lead author on this with Dial last year, and this has just gone live on the web this year, is the Business Model Sustainability Toolkit. And so within that, we have real guidance around cost structure and revenue streams. We have, I think, about 19 or 20 different revenue models you can have a look at, play around with, think about what would work for your digital public good. So just having that codified and catalogued for you to kind of think through is, is really helpful. But the issue is exactly what Faye found. When we were actually doing the research for putting together that business model sustainability toolkit with Dial, we found exactly the same results as you're seeing here from Faye's research. It was all about mentoring. It was all about support in a personal way of people who understood it and knew how to do it. So it's great having the toolkits and they're a real step forward um, because they weren't there before. We're starting to fill in that missing middle I showed, but there still needs to be kind of hand-holding, guidance. There needs to be someone at the other end of the phone who you can pick up. And I was saying to colleagues the other day, I still get messages from organizations I mentored seven, eight years ago who are still grappling with things and they still pick up the phone and say, hey, can we have a chat? We've got a real issue with governance or we've got a real issue with some kind of organizational design thing. So everyone needs that. Everyone needs that kind of expert advice and support in, in their journey. So I know, Ahmed, you'll talk a bit about this, but I run a lot of scale accelerators and scale support programs um, for different funders and um, different organizations. And what we identified, and this is a piece of work I did with the research people and DEP Innovation Labs, um, we looked at what really innovators need. And so on the left, they need strategic mentoring. They need support to be able to look at that whole scaling journey from start to end and all the facets that they're going to need. Well, always amazes me is the amount of people who come up to me six months, 12 months, 18 months later and say, hey, remember that thing you were talking about? Now I've got that problem. Can we talk a bit more about it? Because often people don't know what they don't know. There'll be problems coming up that they can't foresee. So helping them foresee those is really helpful. Training and tools we've talked about. Brokering is really essential, and we heard that in the research. How do you link up with implementing agencies if you want people to adopt it? How do you link up with more finance? Are there other um, co-creators you want to work with? Deep technical support. The amount of times I've had to refer people to IP specialists to talk about just the IP. What kind of open source license is the best approach to go to? Or talking about marketing or PR or comms or your business model. So that deep technical support. Organizational development support. And that's not just if you're a startup. The amount of entrepreneurs who have teams within larger organizations, I have a stopwatch that I use when I'm working with them for how long it takes them to say we want to spin out <laughs> because they struggle within an organization that's not designed for them. And as they scale, I talk about it going from a baby bunny to an 800-pound gorilla. They start causing chaos within the organization because they're making demands that the organization's not used to if it's not set up for it. So that uh, organizational development support's needed. Financial support is clear, and we've seen that. And whether that's through innovation financing, whether it's through different ways of building that sustainable business model. So they're the types of support we often come across, and I'm going to leave it there, because I've probably gone over time. And Ahmed, I'm going to 
hand over. No, Faye's gonna, gonna talk us through the next, but thanks, Faye. Thank you, Ian. You gave us some really good um, practical ways that we can support uh, DPG innovators. And now I would like to introduce you to Ahmed El Said, who is the um, innovation scaling lead for UN Global Pulse. Thank you, Faye. Um, it's very hard to, and thank you, Ian. It's very hard to follow uh, Ian's presentation, so I'll um, I'll make this um, quite brief. So. We've started um, and we've embarked on this journey um, as Global Pulse uh, with support from our partners at the Foreign Ministry uh, of Finland um, and in collaboration with the Digital Public Good Alliance um, more than a year ago. And the journey has been um, quite interesting, I must say, because there has been a lot of um, different um, interesting changes throughout and we've, through feedback that we've received, from the different um, parties and also the different stakeholders, we have decided to pivot a few times to actually um, align with the need. And I think that was part of the lessons that we've learned throughout this journey, that we can start something with uh, a very clear uh, idea and a very um, a well-framed need, but then along the way, um, more priorities come up and changes can push into different directions. And that was, um, it was good that we managed to kind of do that pivoting um, to actually align with something that uh, was, um, is seen as needed. And we've seen from the research findings that Faye has presented and also how that aligned with some of the earlier research that Ian um, elaborated on that we are actually looking now at what we can uh, provide as a service offer for innovators to potentially prepare and ready uh, innovations to scale. And we're looking forward to actually um, addressing some of the things that um, Ian mentioned, of course, within our capacity and in collaboration with the larger UN family and through support channel through the UN family, we hope to be able to um, mobilize the resources necessary to develop some of these uh, support packages, uh, especially the um, mentioned strategic mentoring, uh, training and tools, um, and hopefully also some deep dives and technical support to DPG uh, owners can be part of that support that we provide moving forward. Um, the sustainability question that was raised earlier uh, remains um, a big piece of work that we are trying to uh, also mobilize support to address. Uh, of course, there are some uh, generic solutions that uh, we might look at, but we've heard from innovators and that they would like to uh, see also some specific um, custom tailored um, implementation support, technical support provided in these areas. So that's also an area that we are looking at um, potentially supporting in the next phase. We just came back from a meeting in Oslo that uh, Praja, Praja mentioned earlier, and that was uh, quite useful for us also because we understand now also how the different UN agencies and development partners and other partners and member states are actually looking at this um, issue and what are still some of the issues that we can actually support and how can we best position the level of support that we can provide to actually cover some of the gaps and synergize with existing um, platforms and solutions and ideas for some of these um, challenges. Um, we have, um, yeah, throughout this journey, we've also learned the importance of actually um, customizing the technical support that we provide in this area. So it's, um, we started with MNCH, as Faye alluded, and then it went to a broader health theme, but now we're looking at um, a broad spectrum of um, thematic areas. Uh, for DPGs, and we have also learned from the meeting in Oslo that some DPGs are actually um, cross-cutting and they can um, pivot from one area to the other. They can start within health and then move to education and so forth. And some of the challenges are related to the subject matter, but some of the challenges are quite uh, cross-cutting, and that's a lesson that we will continue um, to learn from. So... Without um, delaying you further, and I know there might be quite a few questions for the next panel, um, I think that we are uh, committed to Global Pulse to um, continuously supporting the roadmap for digital cooperation and working with the Digital Public Goods Alliance uh, to advance on this um, agenda 
and continue to um, develop our offer and service offer for the wider UN agencies and development partners um, in these different areas that you see on the screen as much as we can to actually push uh, DPGs to scale or at least make them ready for scale. There are many elements that will be considered um, in that moving forward. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much for this and thank you for being part of this and for all the um, participants both in person and online and we look forward to continuously engage with you on this important um, agenda. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Ahmed. Uh, we're now moving into our panel session. So I would like to invite two speakers you've already heard from uh, earlier, Ian and Projecta, to come forward. And also uh, Celia Lienonen from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who works in Satu's team. Please take your seats. Uh, we will be having questions live from our audience here in Helsinki and also uh, from the participants online. So feel free to put your questions in the chat or the Q&A. Our panel will be moderated by Razi Latif, who is the um, lab lead for Finland UN Global Pulse. Thank you very much, Faye. <clears throat> um, can I just begin by saying how much I am in awe of the presentations? Um, thank you so much for those. You make digital innovation exciting. So, um, yeah, I was very, very impressed. So thank you for setting the scene like that. Um, so I'm gonna, I've am gonna. i got a few questions for each of the panellists, and then we'll go to some Q&A. Um, so, Projacta, I've got a question for you first. Um, it's from uh, Mika Valatillo. Um, is ComCare open source? Um, on the website, it ha only has a free trial available, otherwise monthly su subscriptions. So more generally, how open source, how is open source defined for DPGs? What qualifies, what does not? Right. Um, I will first answer the first part yep. of it. So ComCare is open source, and you can find ComCare's GitHub account, which is, I think, under Dimagi, which is an organization that sort of produces ComCare, and maybe that's the, and that's another thing, right? Discoverability of DPGs is something that we're working on. But, um, and and I think maybe some section on the site, the, their website should ideally have that GitHub link, but we look into that, but you can go to the DPGA registry, which is digitalpublicgoods.net slash registry. And for every project that is a DPG, every digital solution that is a DPG, you can go find the GitHub link to that project so that you can sort of do the adoption from there. So yes, Comcare is open source. And the later, the latter part of the question was basically, you know, maybe they didn't see it on the website and therefore, mm -hmm. you know, what does it mean for products to be open source? I think it just has to have an open license and it has to have the code available for everyone and then an ability to deploy that code without having to contact that organization. So these three are, I think, core principles, but Ian, if you have anything to add on what it means to be open source, please go ahead. No, I think you've summed it up very well there, but it it can be, be difficult. So yeah, for instance, on Comca, you will go on and there will be kind of a link to, to, to do it. And I think it's that balance between the sustainability of the mighty who takes me back i remember working with them over 10 years ago <laughs> on when i was in the ngo world um and their need to have a sustainable business model yeah. with the ability for people to access it and it's that balance around sustainability and access that we need organizations like that to be sustainable but we also need as much as possible for the software to be open source and so it can be a little bit difficult that manifests itself sometimes in how you access. So I think as um, Praja, you've just said, go on to GitHub mm. and um, search for it on there and it, it will be there. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Priyakta, I'm just going to stay with you for a second. Um, this is a, a good question about how can we encourage countries to use DPGs when they don't have the funding or technical capacity to make the necessary adaptations to software. Right. So I think I'm going to talk from the point of view of what's happening and what are the 
you know what are the things that have worked in the world because i i mean there are many solutions to this right but some of the countries have focused heavily on research and development through universities because for example norway um india is lo- going towards it because what happens is in a in a university you have sustainability of resources right funding is one part of it i think government sometimes funding is something that still can be resolved but i think having enough you know human resources to sort of sustain a dpg is also i think equally important so i think one model would be that you know you the education sector or the um the research and development sector for in inside educational institutions could sort of uptake this part of the challenge where you know as long as the finance is sort of thought of by the member states you at least have the capability to build it so there is a product called dhis2 it's a digital public good work works in health but now across seven eight other use cases like climate education etc and they are deployed in 70 plus countries and one of the success the reasons behind their success they mentioned was the fact that they basically collaborated with universities in every place and then made found advocates for that digital public goods locally so that's also again very important um i don't think any of these digital public goods can be run centrally they have will have to have some sort of local implementation and r&d support beyond the funding right rosie can i just come in on that i, mm-hmm. I agree i think what we need to be wary of looking into the future is there is a strong push in a lot of governments now around commercialization of research mm-hmm. by universities So the whole push to see impact from research in a lot of countries and there's a number of clients that I talk to who are universities who are finding this push now. So I think getting ahead of that to just ensure that there's caveats and clauses and support there for DPGs is really critical mm-hmm. so that they don't get washed away in this tide of um push for commercialization of IP from uh university research. Great. May so I come please. in? Please. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, a, th- a thing that I was planning to take up also is uh, how to integrate DPGs into local innovation system and exactly create these cross-border um, corp- innovation and uh, uh, research cooperation networks where DPGs are present and understood and taken up and prioritized. Mm. That's an important point. Thanks, Celia. Um, in just I'm going to stay with you for for a couple of minutes. Um you talked about innovations getting stuck between the pilot phase and scale and needing a sustainable business model. What needs to change in the funding model for innovators to facilitate this? Yeah, good question. Um you said just a few minutes. <laughs> you did a few hours. Can you um, summarize please? So I think that there's a few things. One is it's it's useful to think of supply and demand so if you think about innovation investment particularly when it comes from grants and those kind of things it's kind of the supply side of, of finance um and how do you transition to the demand side so it's a business model and what's really interesting is a lot of the time when people talk about business models they talk about revenue and costs mm. they don't talk about the investment piece and that transition mm. through um and so a few things really one is there's the idea a very old idea from bain which is about structure and conduct and performance of markets and basically says that the structure will determine the conduct in a market which will determine the performance and although and uh, from the mfa perspective feel free to come back on this donors have a lot of power in that because they can structure a market and that will then lead to conduct and performance. And so that's the first thing think about if funders think about how they're structuring markets. The second is funding for scale is far too small um in both volume and value. Mm-hmm. So we've on another project where we've looked at the state of the humanitarian system, we've worked with I think seven or eight innovation funders. We've looked at their portfolios and you'd expect a skew that there's always an innovation funnel for more prototypes pilots and then um scale but that funnel is too steep at the moment mm-hmm. it needs to have more investment in scale and those investments need to be much bigger um but that's difficult because 
often we have a three-step three process. Um, and so if you're looking at it from a risk perspective, de-risking is, mm. is hard to do. Whereas if you look at the private sector, it's anything from seven to eight steps. And so each step, the risk level is 8%, 9% risk reduction, as it were. Whereas we're looking at 20 to 30% risk reductions we're looking for. So that's quite difficult. So structure the market from a demand side as much as possible. Invest more in scale. Um, but also timelines. It takes a long time to scale things. Mm. So there was an interesting report from Deloitte that went for the World Humanitarian Summit back in 2016, I think. And they looked at timelines it took for innovation systems to mature. Um, and it takes a long time. And so investment cycles of five plus years are needed rather than two to three yeah. years in these kind of scale funds. Sorry. No, I, no, it's good. There was actually a, a question that's linked to that um, from Jim St. Clair at the Linux Foundation talking about models examining return of in, on investment. Um, on, so are there any models which do kind of look at return of investment on innovation? So there's, there's clearly financial models, yeah. <laughs> um, which are, are the, and, and easy to do. There's, there's an issue that you have. The, the one that people would go to is SROI, um, which is social return on investment. If you actually get under the hood of SROI, it's uh, some evidence base and qual and quant data, but a lot of assumptions okay. in most of the models. So it's not the perfect model, but, but you can do that. But the issue that you're having is what's the time frame for your impact? And so SROI is one way to go. I think the second thing when I'm talking to investors and funders is decide what cap you're wearing. Mm. And I talk about funders and donors of being either customers of impact. I give you a million. I expect X amount of boreholes. Mm. Or I'm an investor in future impact. So I'm giving you this money, hopefully, so that we don't need those boreholes and we're going to have a different water system in the future but I don't expect that to be returning back to me anytime mm. soon. And I think when I, I've talked with funders and donors, not understanding what hat yeah. is being worn at any one time is quite difficult because obviously, particularly if it's an institutional donor, you, you, you've got your taxpayers to go back to and yeah. say, actually, this is what we've done with the money. We hope it's going to have impact in five, 10 years is, is a difficult sell sometimes. Yeah, that's a good point. Money looks the same, but it's actually different. Mm depending on where it's coming from. Uh, no, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask Celia a question and then I'm going to ask the audience. Um, um, Celia, just um, from a Finland MFA perspective, could you tell the audience um, what Finland's priorities are for further advancing the DPG agenda kind of, you know, in, in the near long-term future? Sure. Thanks for the question. Um, I think this um, now uh, terminated project has been a very, very important one for us. Uh, we've really valued it and it's been a key contribution of Finland also to the DPGA's important work. And we aim to support this agenda going forward and uh, support our UN partners, including the UN Global Pulse, uh, as well as importantly UNICEF. Mm -hmm. um, which is establishing a global innovation hub here in Helsinki. So they, they work also extensively on open source solutions and um, this new hub on, um, on innovative um, learning solutions will be critical, I think, for uh, developing um, uh, ways and practices in, in this sector specifically. So. Um, health, of course, important mm -hmm. um, education, but then also the UN Global Pulse's work on on scaling will be very very interesting. Um, uh, also, of course, um, uh, advocating for the DPGAs in the broader UN uh, context, mm -hmm. including as part of the um, uh, um, uh, roadmap and um, the our common agenda and the digital compact. Um, these are all very um, large processes where the DPGAs are are visible and and must be visible. 
Um, then um, perhaps um, uh, an interesting thought could be how we work with the private sector here in mm. Finland because mm. we have a, uh, a number of um, instruments through which we um, support uh, Finnish private sector's uh, innovation cooperation in developing uh, countries. Um, so whether within these um, instruments there could be more emphasis on uh, DPGs um, creating kind of pathways to, for them to scale on the ground. Um, so this is something we may uh, think mm. about in the future. Yeah. yeah. I think there's an opportunity for UN agencies to come together also mm. uh, and collaborate. So we're already speaking to UNICEF Innovation mm. um, as they're getting set up here. Um, I just wanted to ask the audience if there's any questions from the audience here physically. Um, yeah. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? There's a mic. Um, there should be a mic behind you. If you could just say who you are and where you're from. Hey, I'm Federica Schuh, and I'm also part of UN Global Pulse. Um, and my question is sort of like really looking at the definition of a digital public good, right? It's quite broad, which is like super exciting, right? It's sort of, it's about software, it's about data, it's about standards, it's about AI models, right? And Project is smiling because she knows <laughs> where I'm going with this question, right? A lot of the conversation today has sort of really been focused on software and that's really fantastic, right? But I, I was wondering if we can quickly also talk about the opportunity that we have as we're also looking to, to sort of think about the data component, right? The standards component, and then also the sort of like AI model component. And I think it's really a question for all three of you, right? From a funder's perspective, I'd be very sort of interested in also what are the opportunities that you see when it comes to the, the data and the standards component, right? From the DPGA perspective, right? I'm interested how you're thinking about the standard, right? What do you see as current challenges in fostering these different types of DPGs? And what do you think uh, uh, can we do to overcome that? And then from a scaling perspective, what are the scaling opportunities? And also, are there specific barriers that are unique to these elements that are not software as we're sort of also looking to push that frontier. Thank you, Frederica. Um, should we start this side and mm. move that way? So, Celia. Yeah, indeed, important question. And I think for donors, um, it's it's a question of, uh, because we are we're doing a lot of work on, on uh, strengthening um, local partner countries, uh, data economies and data regulation and policies, how we take uh, DPGs there into account and how they are embedded in the national regulatory frameworks and systems. And um, this is something that um, is an area where, where also donors need to have more attention and also coordinate better. So this is my, my question to your uh, question on data. Thank you. Thanks, Celia. Right. I'm going to narrate a small... So we had this um, meeting recently, and we had somebody from the nuclear test ban treaties. So the way they sort of monitor, you know, um, and, and how the system or the architecture that they have in place could be used for use cases for food security, for example, or climate change, right? So open data has a lot of potential. And, you know, we've discussed earlier as well, how do we sort of share this data amongst, of course, development partners, but also beyond is going to be very important. And I think there is some scope for, because the standard, the DPG standard is an evolving process, right? And there is scope for us to sort of evolve from where we are in terms of our understanding of open data. And for that reason, we've actually... Uh, set up a community of practice in partnership with UN Global Pulse and, you know, GDI uh, to think through how open data DPGs can have larger sort of impact and, you know, maybe be more interoperable in that sense. Um, so I also invite if there are any organizations or experts that would like to join this community of practice, they can also reach out to us and, you know, sort of they'll be part of it. And uh, so open data does have, just to conclude, open data does have a lot of potential which is across use cases right across sectors and and i do think that the dpg standard needs to evolve more mm -hmm. to sort of address a lot of those needs and that's mm -hmm. where we are heading um thanks ian yeah i think on the data side it's the area with the most potential and the most risk <laughs> as, <laughs> as you well know um and so getting this right is critical 
And I think just the very existence of the alliance is the first big step. So I think getting some agreement on standards mm -hmm. um, and then trying to push those forward, obviously, is, is critical. Um, whenever that's kind of happened, it, it needs to be consensus-based and it, needs, it takes a while. Um, and so I think we all have our concerns about sec data security. We all have our concerns about how it's used. And, but I think going through a body like mm. the Alliance is pretty critical on that. And I, but I also think that is where a lot of the member states um, focus should be rather than software. <laughs> as it were, is really on that, because getting that right is key. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're, we're out of time, so I'm going to have to wrap up now. Um, I wanted to say a huge thank you. Really, really interesting, informative presentations. I learned a great deal, so thank you so much. So um, I also want to say a big thank you, in addition to the panellists, um, Ahmed, thanks so much for kind of leading and steering this. And Faye, you've done a great job today, so thank you so much. But the last thanks, I think, uh, just in terms of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for supporting this. I like it when you support something and it becomes bigger and brighter than actually what you envisaged. Sure. Uh, and I think that's what's happened here. Mm. And maybe, hopefully, we'll continue to do that. So really thankful for the support of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And with that, I will hand back to Faye, who will give us some ideas about how we will network. Faye. Thank you, Razi. And I would like to add my thanks to all the speakers today for giving up their time um, to us. So uh, luckily for the people here in Helsinki, we can take this wonderful sunny day that we're experiencing and network amongst ourselves. But also for all of you online, thank you for joining us. And you have the opportunity for some speed networking, which is a bit like speed dating, if you're ever unfortunate enough to do that. Um, you'll be paired up with somebody at random and have three minutes to talk to each other, make a connection. Don't leave it until the last second to swap your LinkedIn address or you'll only get half of it. Um, if you look to the left of your screen, you'll see a little networking icon. If you go over there, you'll go straight into the networking session. So thank you all for joining us today. Goodbye. <laughs>